Hi everyone, my name's Karen and I work for the Eve Appeal, the UK's gynaecological cancer research charity. Now it's Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month and I'm joined by the lovely Dr Ellie Cannon, hello, hello who is a GP and fantastic ambassador for the Eve Appeal. So we're going to be shining a spotlight on ovarian cancer and asking Ellie some questions about all sorts of different subjects related to ovarian cancer. Can you tell me the main symptoms of ovarian cancer? We always say with ovarian cancer that the signs and symptoms aren't really very specific and that's because there isn't really sort of one red flag symptom um, that we see that just means ovarian cancer. So it's really looking for a whole pattern of things. Bloating is very important, so bloating that tends to stay, so not mm. bloating that sort of comes and goes. Or like just like of, after a big meal or something. Exactly, yeah. so bloating that actually sort of stays and is persistent. Um, you can get changes in your bladder and bowel, so some women present with ovarian cancer actually with symptoms of going to the loo a lot. Um, pelvic pain is another one again that could be a symptom of a lot of different things and then there are sort of some more general things feeling very tired feeling fatigued uncomfortable um, but that any of those should prompt a visit to the doctor we've discussed kind of the main symptoms mm. of ovarian cancer are there any lesser known or quite unusual symptoms sometimes we hear about women who have had some postmenopausal bleeding mm -hmm. and that seems to have been a sign of their ovarian cancer. So all postmenopausal bleeding is very important, it's what we call a red flag sign, something yeah. to discuss with a doctor. Um, sometimes with ovarian cancer women can have a very small amount of postmenopausal bleeding, so maybe even more what you would call a bloody discharge mm. or a pinkish discharge. Um, and that is unusual. Again, going back to it's not normal for you, that is something to be discussed with a GP. So any abnormal bleeding, basically report it. Mm. So any abnormal bleeding should be a red flag for a woman because obviously it can be a sign of many different gynaecological cancers. So if you're bleeding when you shouldn't be, you should always be reporting it. Keep that period diary. Exactly. Does everyone with ovarian cancer experience symptoms? No, they don't, and that's mm. really a big problem. Your ovaries are very deep within your body, um, so they can be changing or they could have a tumour on them without actually you feeling it. Um, so in the early stages of ovarian cancer, when a tumour may be small, actually people may not have symptoms. Um, sometimes ovarian cancer is picked up on a scan or on blood tests which are done for other reasons. Mm. So it, it, it's difficult because no, not everybody with ovarian cancer will have symptoms. How can I differentiate potential ovarian cancer from other abdominal problems, for example IBS and PCOS, so irritable bowel syndrome and polycystic ovary syndrome? So I think that's a really good question mm -hmm. because we always talk about ovarian cancer mimicking um, these other conditions. Mm -hmm. And is the bloating <clears throat> like different? So say I had IBS and mm. felt bloated, mm. is that going to feel different to if I had ovarian cancer and felt bloated? Like what, what does the bloating feel like in the two different conditions? So it really should feel quite different. So the bloating with IBS feels quite airy and mm. your tummy feels very drum-like. Um, the bloating of IBS comes and goes, and it will come and go depending on what you've eaten, what your trigger foods are, whether you've opened your bowels or mm. not. Whereas we talk about the bloating with ovarian cancer as being persistent, doesn't come and go throughout the day, doesn't sort of dispel overnight and then come back in the morning. So the bloating can be quite different. The other thing with IBS, which I think is really crucial for women to know, is that most people with IBS have it from their teen years and from their 20s. I've heard this, you don't suddenly get it. You don't IBS. suddenly get it, <clears throat> and that's important in mm. terms of it mimicking ovarian cancer and bowel cancer, actually. Mm. You, know, you don't suddenly get it in your 40s, 50s or 60s. A new, a new diagnosis or a new feeling of IBS mm. should really mm. make a woman and a doctor think, actually, is this something else? Mm. So persistent bloating, bloating that just doesn't go away is kind of one of the main things to look out for. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
Why do GPs find it hard to diagnose ovarian cancer? It's a complicated one. I think that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, and I think it's Im really important to ask that as well. To I a feel GP. bad asking you that. No, I, I think that's really important to yeah. ask because I, I don't see that as a blaming question. Yeah. I see that, you know, that, you know, it is an issue. And it's an issue because ovarian cancer often presents um, sort of quite, quite late. Mm. Um, we don't have one great test that's very specific and also it mimics lots of other conditions. Mm. So if you come to me and I suspect your symptoms might fall into that category of ovarian cancer, um, then there's also a lot of other conditions that I suppose I almost want to diagnose more yeah, for you. You'd rather tell me I've got IBS. Of course, right? I'd yeah, rather of course you tell would, you yeah. you've got IBS. Um, or tell you that you've got sort of polycystic ovaries or just sort of something mm. much more benign. So there is that sort of little bit of bias there. Um, from a testing point of view, um, we have um, a blood test called CA125, which can point us in the right direction towards ovarian mm. cancer and should be very accessible for GPs. Um, some GPs have quite good access to ultrasound scans, which again is a good way of looking at the ovaries, but not sort of gold standard. Yeah. Um, so the diagnostic process is a little bit sort of, is a little bit clunky. Yeah. It's not so easy. We can't, we obviously examine patients, but we can't examine sort of the ovaries yeah. just sort of on an examination if you couch. You on the couch. You couldn't, you couldn't see my ovaries. No, you? no, I might feel, I might feel sort of some pelvic tenderness. I might feel a mass if something was, you know, sort of very far down the mm. line. Um, so it, it's not a smooth linear process. It has to be a partnership between mm. the patient and the doctor. So that's should I say to you? I'm worried about ovarian cancer because what should kind of the patient if they've got these potential symptoms mm. which are probably we should stress not ovarian cancer mm. should I as a patient come to you and, and express that I'm worried about ovarian cancer or kind of what should yeah what should the person coming to you be saying for you to kind of be alerted to the fact that it might be a an ovarian cancer. Yeah, I think, I mean, I would say there are two really key things that a patient needs to do. So first of all, bring that into the conversation, because if you mention that, then we feel also comfortable to mention that. Yeah. Um, so if you mention ovarian mm. cancer, then that's there, that's part of the sort of diagnostic process. The second thing I would say is that Diagnosis doesn't just happen, obviously, in one 10-minute GP appointment. It's a linear process. You come in, we order some tests, you go away, you come back for those test results, then there might be some more test results if those ones have been normal. And that can particularly happen with ovarian cancer because often we're trying to rule out these other things mm. like IBS. So you might have gone down a pathway of ruling out the bowel stuff, but you have to then be coming back mm and being conscientious to be coming back and saying, right, we've done that, we know that I don't have IBS, what's next, what's next, what's mm. next? So I would say the second thing that's really crucial is to be that conscientious patient as you walk out the door from the GP, book your follow-up appointment, your review appointment, whether it's on the telephone or face-to-face, -face, make sure you're going down that linear process mm. because often what we see not just with ovarian cancer, but with lots of things, is it's all started very well. And then the sort of follow-up, the journey that we had to then go on to get a diagnosis quickly has sort of broken down.